If social media makes something a story, then often it would be picked up by mainstream media. Over the past decade, there's been an explosion of social media websites and diatribe. Internationally, with international and domestic consequences. The emergence of, some, of what some would call an organized Islamophobic network, which is largely, these are largely engineered campaigns, have grown and been persistent. You have a cottage industry of pundits, bloggers, authors, documentaries, lobbyists, elected officials, who have meticulously cultivated an ideologically agenda-driven anti-Muslim polemicism. Again, not simply anti-extremism, but anti-Muslim. Islam is the problem. Muslims are the problem. In an August 2011 report called Fear, Inc., a 10-year study of only seven foundations, seven American foundations, found that $42.6 million dollars flowed from those foundations to Islamophobic authors and websites. A CARE report in 2013, and by the way, the CARE report, as with these other reports, are based on IRS returns, income tax returns. So it's not a matter that somebody is saying, you know, money is going for this purpose to this organization uh, simply as an assertion. It's based on what people are actually doing. Okay. That report, Legislating Fear, which looked at only a three-year period, found that $119 million plus change in total revenue went from 2008 to 2011, that three-year report. Radicalization, what are the main reasons why some Muslims in the West have become militants? Studies by the EC network of experts that deal with radicalization. There were two Americans on it. I was on it. I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, for a number of years, um, confirm that authoritarian re regimes and U.S. foreign policy, I would say Western foreign policy, but the U.S. is a major driver here. We like to feel that we sort of lead the world, and in some of these areas we do, in the negative side as well, okay? Um, that that the attitudes towards Muslim-majority countries are the primary cause of grievances of most militant groups and homegrown terrorists. When you, look at, when you look at a number of studies, for example, um, in one study, 25 plots involving 57 individuals in the so-called homegrown jihadist terrorist uh, area directed against the United, were directed against the United States from 9-11 to the spring of 2011. But when you actually look at the situation, it gets interesting. You have Dr. Nadal Hassan, a psychiatrist in the military, military officer and psychiatrist gave a presentation two years before he then became involved in one of the major, uh, quote, uh, Muslim terrorist attacks within the U.S. He gave a paper entitled, Why the War on Terror is a War Against Islam. That was the major driver, why the war on terror is a war against Islam. On the other hand, during his plea hearing, the Times Square bomber, Faisal Shahzad, repeatedly referred to the U.S. war against Allah and war with Muslims. Antonio Martinez, who attempted to bomb a military recruitment center in Maryland, stated each and every Muslim in this country knows that America is at war with Islam. So there's that, that image, that project, a projected image, Again, not of a selective war with terrorists, but that broad-based image that then brushstrokes Islam and Muslims. And that's why, for example, if you look at Gallup data and Pew data often, looking at the United States and Europe, you see that there's a disproportionate sense among many in the population, understandably, given the disproportionate coverage in media, that the issue is the religion of Islam rather than distorted interpretations of Islam. The issue is uh, potentially with a majority of Muslims rather than with a very small but deadly minority of uh, Muslims. I mean, a good example of it is trying to deal with something like, uh, like ISIS. 
It's significant because terrorist groups only need a few people to terrorize. But if you look at the overall numbers, those numbers are usually seen as anything between 22,000 and 30,000. And yet we talk about a global war. What we're doing is repeating the very language of ISIS. And we can get into this in the Q&A, you know, whether or not one wants to actually almost enable or buttress the very claims of some of these, uh, of these groups. Let's think about some of the sources for the problem, the sources of alienation and radicalization. While the majority of American and European Muslims are mainstream and moderate, many are alienated by domestic and foreign policies. But the vast majority are upset with foreign policies or domestic policies. I grew up as Italian-American. The gangsters, the criminal people in American media for years were Italian, were mafia. And you knew it. They used the word all the time to brush stroke us. And when they didn't say it, they were usually dark, swarthy people who seemed to have Italian accents or seemed to have names that ended in a vowel, as somebody said to me. Yes, a great, great wasp academic actually said that publicly. You people whose names end in a vowel. OK. All right. But in any case, in my time, for a number of years, we were the stereotype. And I happen to fulfill some of that. You know, I mean, my dad was like your average white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, put you to sleep. Uh, my mother was Sicilian. My father was Neapolitan. I take after my mother, so there's this sort of stereotype that we were all, you know, very, very active. We, uh, as, as one person said to me, you know, why do you get so upset? And I said, don't worry about the fact that I get upset. You should be concerned about what I'm upset about. You know, so I don't, as, as, as I shouldn't, tell you this story, but anyway, I was in a monastery for 10 years. I think I may have mentioned it, maybe not. Okay, all right, let's, okay. So I was in a monastery and we, in my order, we were Franciscans, we weren't Jesuits. Jesuits education is really valued, PhDs. We were supposed to be serving with the people. So we only picked like one person to be a professor of something. You know, so if you wanted to go to grad school, you had to be that lucky one. Well, it was down between two of us. And I got turned down. And uh, I went in and I said, why? By the way, I didn't have, the personality you see now was not my personality growing up. I was the shy person in the back of the room, graduate school, people never saw me, young professor never saw me. My personality developed at a certain point after uh, the Iranian revolution, basically. <laughs> but I remember going in, in, into my, to my professor and I said, you know, I thought I had like the highest grades and how come I didn't get picked and so-and-so got picked? And he said, you know, you're too emotional. I said, well, what should I do? And he said, you need to walk like me. You need to talk like me. <laughs> he was the most boring professor I've ever had. A very saintly priest, but really one of the most boring professors in the world. He said, I said, well, what's the problem? He said, you have the ability to excite students in a classroom. I thought, my, isn't that interesting? Well, the guy that got it after he was ordained disappeared, went to Ireland, and the rumor was that he went over to fight with the IRA. Turns out that was only a rumor, but in any case. Uh, but was living with a woman, found the real path, and uh, having a grand old time. Okay, so when we actually look at the sources of alienation and radicalization, what do we see? A majority of American and European Muslims who are mainstream and moderate, but an alienated minority. And out of that minority, an even smaller minority. If you actually look at the percentages, they are very small in terms of the, the numbers of radicalized people in Europe and America. They may be deadly, but they're very, very small. The reason why they're so effective is that, as we know, unlike the good old days, when we had huge countries going to war, now, with modern technology, a small group of people, one person, two people, six people, can have an incredible impact. And even sometimes measuring the size of some of these radical groups becomes difficult because the level of violence they can commit is so disproportionate that we have no idea about the actual numbers of the group. Whereas when you have conventional warfare, it's just much easier. You see all those planes, or you see all of those foot soldiers. Okay. 
A crisis of identity for many becomes an issue for this minority of extremists. American and European Muslims struggle, those to become radicalized, with a situation of identity, a situation of feeling alienated, particularly in societies that often are Islamophobic in their TV coverage, in the rhetoric of their politicians, etc. A classic example is looking at American elections, presidential elections, the, the two elections of Obama, congressional elections, and looking at our candidates, and even looking at candidates today. Look at some of the, the candidates, particularly the Republican candidates, and the kinds of things that they say and the kinds of policies that they advocate. It's hard to believe that we have such a robust educational system when you look at some of the stuff that's out there now and how easily people can be swayed and mobilized. In contrast to most American Muslims, European Muslims are in a much different situation socioeconomically. American Muslims, with the exception of African Muslims, highly professionalized, integrated into society, therefore much faster. The real influx of many European Muslims were really working class folks that came from more rural areas, came into countries that really didn't want them other than as laborers, and basically were restricted and lived in rather ghettoized situations. That sense of second-class citizenship, of social exclusion, can often then lead to marginalization and alienation, and also can also feed uh, problems with crime. Some then become vulnerable to militant interpretations of Islam and jihadist groups. Alienation and radicalization feeds not only domestic terrorism, but an identification globally. They see a double standard, not only in domestic, but also foreign policies. Selective es espousal of democracy and human rights in the Muslim world, support for authoritarian and repressive regimes by so-called democracies, that is, Europe and America. We know that historically. We may not like them, but we support this. Is religion the primary cause and catalyst for political violence and terrorism. Major polls have consistently reported that Islam is a significant component of religious and cultural identity for Muslims. Violent extremists use that as an instrument for legitimation and mobilization. But if you actually look, for example, at bin Laden's tirades, if you look at uh, much of the rhetoric of many of the organizations, and particularly what they do, it's very much concerned with political power. The violence and the terror are concerned with political power, but legitimated in the name of religion. What in the old days would have been legitimated in the name of Arab nationalism or Arab socialism by some radical groups. As the Gallup World Poll of Muslims but also Pew polls and other polls, but certainly Gallup in some 35 countries reported the most frequent response of those polled was the importance and their attachment to their spiritual and moral values. However, the primary catalyst for extremism, often seen as inseparable from the threat to Muslim religious and cultural identity, is the threat of political domination and occupation. If you look at most studies of radicalization and, and, and terrorism, most of it has to do with the belief, if not the reality, and often it's also the reality, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of occupation, of a sense of occupation. And therefore, the, locally, you're, you're, you're feeling, A, you've got authoritarian governments, so your government's the enemy, but then it's also the outside powers that, in fact, are supporting your government, that are training, providing arms sales, up to these governments, etc. One need only look at the uh, Shah of Iran, but one can look more recently at some of the contracts that are being now uh, uh, given to Britain and the United States, the amounts of, of money that are being uh, expended for, uh, for arms, but those arms are not just being used against terrorism by authoritarian regimes, but often against populations in general. 
While the religion of Islam does play a significant role, political grievances pl play a trumping role from my point of view and are often intertwined with religion because religion provides the broad-based legitimator. ISIS execution videos underscore the importance of political grievances as motivations to join. Western military invasion, occupation, support of authoritarian, for, uh, authoritarian regimes are all brought out in those videos. And by the way, this was also used by Al-Qaeda. <clears throat> If we look at studies of Islam and suicide terrorism, historically, suicide bombing is not exclusively associated with Islam. Actually, the Tamil Tigers uh, really were the, if you were, that, that was their sole resource. And interestingly, the Tamil Tigers are basically hardline Marxists, but even they used religion to mobilize popular support because they know where populations are coming from. But as witnessed in Northern Ireland, Sri Lanka, Israel, India, Lebanon, Palestine, Pakistan, post-Saddam, Iraq, Kashmir, Chechnya, the major goal has often been nationalist to end occupation of lands, to force military forces from what these movements regard as their homeland. However, while terrorists use religious appeals to recruit volunteers, is religion the key catalyst? Contrary to conventional wisdom, Robert Pape's work, P-A-P-E, you want to look at his work over the years, uh, is the best. He looks at a 25-year period and looks across religions and finds that while there are some differences, that basically suicide bombing and terrorism were not and are not simply driven by blind religious, ethnic, or cultural hatred, but by real or perceived injustices, especially associated with occupation. Both self-selected religious and even secular groups therefore have, trained, have framed their terrorist acts within that powerful religious medium, and again, the Tamil Tigers are the people to look at. Now, let's look very briefly at the rise of ISIS. I think we're okay here. But how many more minutes do I have? Do I have five minutes? Eight minutes. Eight. Eight minutes, okay. Do I hear 10? Do I hear 12? Okay. Sold, 15, okay. All right. Uh, suicide bombing and terrorism, okay, therefore, are to be seen primarily in terms of occupation. Both self-described religious and even secular groups have moved in that direction. If we look at ISIS, what we see is ISIS arising in an area where you have authoritarianism and repression. The lack of political inclusiveness in many of these countries. The fact that the Arab Spring became an Arab winter. Not just because extremists stepped forward, but the fact is that both in Egypt and in Tunisia, you had, in many ways, the hijacking of democracy. Whatever the complaints about the Muslim Brotherhood, if you actually do a spreadsheet, and I challenged people, and nobody steps up to it, do a spreadsheet of the Muslim Brotherhood in power, and then of Sisi government, in terms of violence, terrorism, number of people arrested, numbers of people disappearing, etc. And it is remarkable. Lack of political inclusiveness in Arab countries has risked, disaffected, and alienate, alienated opponents, some of whom seek an alternative means. A power vacuum has enabled separatist movements, particularly in the name of the Islamic State, to garner supporters and take hold and govern large areas of land in Syria and Iraq, but to move beyond that. But again, if you take a look at the actions, they are usually political, territorial, but legitimated. And ISIS does, compared to other movements, far more use religious language and to legitimate itself. Although many of its followers are not necessarily people who are particularly religious. You know, for example, if you look at the, uh, the situation in Iraq, many Sunni, you know, former military, former police, etc., gravitated because this became an option for them. But it wasn't primarily for religious reasons. Religion has become a tool to legitimate narratives of marginalization, anguish, discontent, and to recruit and mobilize. The entrenchment of authoritarian regimes, lack, or, lack of or limited possibility for significant political representation, government repression of mainstream Islamists and non-Islamists, only perpetuate the search for an alternative means. If and when ISIS, and this is important, 
if and when ISIS disappears or is defeated, if we don't address the root causes of terrorism, it will continue. Root causes have been there for 15 years. Movements have come and gone. Movements disappear, new, new, new movements will come. You will have a significant minority of people who, if they feel marginalized, will turn to violence and extremism. And by the way, if you study violent groups in, uh, who, uh, in other traditions, you see the same thing. You know, you can see it in terms of Buddha, Buddhist radicalism today. Uh, I'm only talking about Buddhist radicalism. Hindu radicalism today. Jewish radicalism today. Okay. Which goes against, if you will, the tenets of mainstream of Judaism. Moving forward, an overarching challenge. The US and the EU in particular has consistently sided with authoritarian regimes historically. The response to the Arab Spring was very tepid. Within one week, you would have the President of the United States say one thing, the Secretary of State say the, another thing. One person would say, Mr. Mubarak is one of our oldest allies. The others will say, we, we respect the right of the people. <laughs> then people didn't know what to happen when, in fact, these regimes, which have been in for decades, so then it was a slow movement to acceptance. And then as soon as things got touchy, in fact, you wind up backing out. And to this day, having seen a coup in Egypt, the United States has not recognized a coup. A coup is a coup is a coup. In other words, you have a definition of a coup. A coup occurred. But the reason why you can't recognize a coup in the United States is that if you do, then Congress will not, cannot, under our system, appropriate funds at any point uh, to, to that government. And so, therefore, the thousands who were massacred, the levels of violence, the thousands imprisoned, etc., wind up getting a tepid response from government. We had the Secretary of State on more than one occasion saying, in effect, well, things are difficult there, but Egypt's on the right road. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Um, the uh, former uh, key leader in the EU, um, uh, during uh, the, the problems that were occurring, and I apologize, I'm going uh, through, is there any water or something? I just want to throw some on my face. No, I want to drink some, thank you. Um, thanks. It's just, I'm, I'm really spacing out right now. Okay, thanks. No, I'm just going to drop it. There's no place here to put water. Um, is, that about, is that a bottle of alcohol? Thank you. Uh, okay, Bombay Sapphire is my favorite, in case you want to send a gift to my room. Okay. Um, in any case, um, the, the reality of it is that as we attempt to move forward, we need to recognize the extent to which we were very quick to quit and run and to accept the coup in Egypt. Now, one can say a lot of people in Egypt were upset. Well, as one congressman said in hearings, gee, there are times when, president, when a president's numbers really drop low. Does that mean that the way in which we bring about change is not to wait for elections that are coming up in six months, but rather to have a military coup with, with the then numbers of people who were killed, the thousands that were, were killed? The level of violence in Egypt and killing was greater than under any modern government from Gamal Abdel Nasser down. And somehow one forgets that. Okay, where do we go from here? The real need as we move forward is for the US and Europe to not only construct a new narrative, what we've done is gone back to the old narrative. We accepted the notion of democratization, but then now in the name of violence and extremism, we've gone back to the old narrative which tends to be that this is a global war, that's what makes it convenient, so then we can join together with everybody. Authoritarian Arab regimes, Russia, whomever, to fight this global war. When you actually look at the numbers involved, not that with terrorism you can't have the explosive events, but the actual numbers on the ground, we turn it into a world war when you have this tremendous disparity of numbers. And we forget that, again, I want to emphasize this, if ISIS were taken out, and it's not going to happen very quickly, the reality of it is, unless we address root causes in society, in societies with huge youth bulge, societies where people no longer will simply tolerate because of international media, okay, and 
their own situations at home, the, the levels of repression that they've had, you have a pressure cooker effect, okay? It will blow the top off. Now, the vast majority won't turn to terrorism, but the terrorist factor will continue to be there in that society. What we now see is a world which in, in the name of combating violent extremism, CVE, okay, everything is possible, i.e. you have allies who couldn't stand each other before, supporting, and th those allies, many of which are authoritarian regimes, authoritarian regimes in the Arab and Muslim world which have become even more authoritarian than they ever were before, have all kinds of outside foreigners coming to fight with them. Um, uh, if it weren't for the jet lag, I just read about a group that came, where is it from? It was just in the news yesterday, from way outside the region, were brought in to fight uh, 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 in the Arab world. I mean, it's, you, you know, we're talking about incredible movements of population. You know, the UAE has brought in foreign fighters of, of all kinds of backgrounds. As, as, as have a number of other Arab countries. The real need is for the US and Europe to not only construct a new narrative that emphasizes self-determination, government accountability, at the same time as fighting extremism and terrorism, that emphasizes the rule of law and human rights. Failure to address their root causes prioritizes stability uh, conditions that divert us from real stability and institutional reform. Failure to do so legitimates the widespread belief in the Arab world that the US and the EU have a double standard when it comes to the promotion and support of democratization. It reinforces anti-Westernism as well as the mantra, the mantra of militant extremists themselves that neither Arab regimes nor their Western allies will allow real people power and it can fuel greater radicalization and recruitment by terrorist organizations. Thank you. Radicalization, but also Islamophobia.